The parent yields such power over the heart of young children. Verse 24, and she went out and said to her mother. So she went out, her mother's not in there. She went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. So why did she ask for the head? Why didn't she just say, kill John the Baptist? The life of John the Baptist. We don't know, we're not told. The only thing I could suspect was that we were just told that Herod wants to keep John safe. So perhaps... Herodias is smart enough and perhaps she knows her husband well enough to know that she needs proof that Herod can't just come and say, all right, I'll give you that and it's done and send somebody out to take John out and then say, say to Herodias, yeah, he's killed and we threw him in the, the pile in Gehenna. Perhaps Herodias wants proof and the proof that she wants is in a hand or a leg or a foot The proof that she wants perhaps is the head. That's the only thing that I can think of. But in whatever case, it does make the story much more dramatic. I want the head of John the Baptist. So notice here just the stark contrast, the stark contrast between what the earthly kingdom values and what the heavenly kingdom values, what the the physical kingdom values and what the spiritual kingdom values. So the earthly kingdom, they value John the Baptist as nothing more than just a form of entertainment for this drunken party. I mean, that's, that's really all the value that he holds for them. It's just some form of entertainment. Just, just bring in his head on a platter. That'll sort of round out the night's festivities in a fun way. We'll all sort of have our laughs at John's head right there on a platter. That's all John is to them. Kind of like Samson. Remember Samson? Some parallels here with Samson. Remember as as Samson, his his eyes are gouged out, he's blinded, and they bring him in as entertainment for the Philistines. In In a similar sort of way, John's head is nothing more than entertainment for the Herodians here. Meanwhile, Jesus, speaking of the same man in Matthew 11, verse 11, says there's been none greater. There's been no prophet greater than this man. All those prophets of old, including Moses, none of them were greater than this man. You see, you see the stark contrast in what the spiritual values and what the earthly values. Verse 25, and she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Here we see what I think is the starkest lesson of the story. And should we put it this way, just the powerful influence of a parent. The powerful influence of a parent. Here's how I see that in the text. Notice when Herod makes this vow. Notice how quickly she's got to run and ask mom. And she runs and she gets the news from mom. And then we're told specifically that with haste, immediately she comes back. in, And then she makes the request. And it's not just any request. Did you notice what she added to it? Herodias asked for the head of John the Baptist. It seems as though Salome added the platter part. But one thing is for sure, there was no hesitation. In this, what, what I see is a young girl, 11, 12, 13, maybe 14-year-old girl who is so eager to please her mother because in her mother's pleasure, she finds her own worth. Do you know that that's what God has planted into the hearts of all people? And it's strongest, of course, in children that in the pleasure of your parents, you find your delight, your desire, your worth. And in such a thing as that, the parent yields such power over the heart of young children. This mother 
has wielded such power over Salome's heart. Notice what she's going to do. Not only has she displayed her body to a room full of lusting men, probably some of them were strangers to her, but this young girl is going to be handed on a platter a freshly decapitated head. Now, most of you in the room are adults. What would you do if someone handed you a freshly decapitated head? Would you shriek? Would that platter hit the floor with a crash and then the head roll off? That's what we would do. Such a repulsive thing as that. Notice something about the heart of this poor young girl. There's no indication that this bothered her in any way. She takes the head, takes it back into the party. She has been so hardened and so calloused from a mother who has raised her to show her that what she values are things like incestuous relationships, adulterous relationships, the putting of self above others, the devaluing of marriage, the devaluing of human life to the point that she, as a young girl, can literally be handed the freshly decapitated, still bleeding head of John the Baptist with the blank look in the eyes and the expressionless face and the fluid still coming out of the head, she can take that, apparently without any real hesitation. What a sad story of a sad young life. Salome was a sinner, just like you and me. But she has had the power of the influence of her mother and what her mother finds pleasing. She has had that so influence her as to callous her heart in a way that's almost indescribable. So folks, let me just remind you of the power that you hold over your children, whether they're adults or small children. Because what pleases you is what motivates them. What pleases you is what shapes their hearts. What they see in you as what you find pleasing, that is what shapes their soul. No one can convert their child. But we hold great power in shaping Can we say the shape of their soul? You know, it breaks my heart to see, and I see this on a regular basis and you see it too, it breaks my heart to see parents of young children laughing when their young children are acting so sinfully. When their young children are acting in ways that are so selfish and so self-centered and so sassy and so disrespectful of adults that if that behavior came from an adult, nobody would like that. Everybody would call that what it is, which is sin. But when it comes from a cute little child and the parent laughs at it, you know that laughter is one of the greatest forms of approval. What you laugh at is what you approve of. And doesn't it break your heart that for the sake of cuteness, so many children are encouraged at young age young ages to act in such selfish, self-centered, disrespectful ways and to have their soul shaped like this. And the same thing is true for adult children. What you approve of in your adult child holds great power for them. And so many of them wouldn't say it. Maybe they wouldn't admit it, but it's still true. They can be 40 years old, 50 years old. I'm 52. And what your parents approve of still shapes you. So just a word of caution and encouragement for everyone in the room. Take great care in what you approve of. Take great care in what you show your children brings you pleasure. Do Do your children see you taking pleasure in those Netflix shows that they've got to leave the room for you to see? 
Or do your children see you take pleasure in daily opening the Word and getting up early before work to meet God in His Word and placing a priority in the gathering of God's people? Do your children see you valuing that? Because what they see you value is what will shape their soul. You cannot convert them. You cannot gain salvation for them. But you can shape what they value. And you can shape the softness or the callousness of their hearts. This poor young girl probably hasn't experienced her 12th birthday yet. And her heart has been made so cold and so calloused and so uncaring and so unfeeling that any way of salvation for her must climb over a wall tall and wide and strong. But this is the picture that we're shown. The power of the influence of a parent. Now verse 26. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. So here we see a number of things. We see, of course, the fear of man. Man, He's more afraid of what the people in the room think of him. Even though most people in the room probably don't even like him. Most people in the room would probably, probably betray him at the drop of a hat. Nevertheless, He cares more for their opinion of him than for the life of John the Baptist. Contrast, if you will, just just the the stark contrast between Herod and John. Here's a man that is so afraid of what people think of him that he will behead the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Meanwhile, in prison, there sits one who was so who had such a fear of God that the fear of man had no place in his life to such a degree that the Pharisees would make this two-day journey out to the wilderness to hear him preach and be baptized by him. And he would say to to them, Who told you to flee the coming wrath, you brood of vipers? That's a man with no fear of man because he fears God. Contrasted against one who does not fear God, but instead fears what everyone thinks about him. Notice also the parallel with Elijah. We don't need to go into that, but the same thing that we saw in Elijah. We see the fear of man. Because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. her. We also see the progressive nature of sin. Sin will always do the same thing, and that is progress and take more and consume more and kill more. Sin is never content with what it has. Sin knows only one thing, and that is to grow. It's like cancer. You cannot say to cancer, it's okay if you just have my spleen, just leave everything else to me. It doesn't work that way. It's all right if you just have this one lung, just stay right there and we'll be friends. It doesn't work that way. Sin is like termites. You cannot say to, to a nest of termites, you know, why don't you only eat these boards over here? And well, I'll leave you alone as long as you don't eat the rest of the boards in the house. No, they're going to eat every board in the house until either you destroy them or they destroy the house. Same thing with cancer. Same thing with sin. You cannot contain it. You cannot manage it. So we see here the one sin leads to a second, leads to another and another and another. That's the way sin is. But we also see something that's really helpful to see. Verse 26 again, And the king was exceedingly sorry. Exceedingly sorry. That's a word that Mark is only going to use one other time. And that's at the end of the gospel to describe the emotions of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. So here Mark is thinking of a word and he's thinking, what word can I use to describe Herod's heart, Herod's attitude when he learned that his foolish vow is now going to cost the life of John? What word should I use to describe his... Oh, I'll use this one. The same word that I'm going to use to describe Jesus' heart in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's how sorrowful Herod was. But here's the takeaway there. It doesn't matter. Herod can have in his heart all of the sorrow in the world and sorrow can never lead him to obedience. All of the sorrow that the world has ever known cannot produce righteousness. That's why Paul will say to the Corinthians that there is a godly sorrow that leads to life, but there is also a worldly grief that leads not to life, but it leads to death. 
And this is the sorrow that Herod has. And it doesn't matter how sorry he is because all the sorrow in the world won't change his heart. All the sorrow in the world won't give him the power to obey. Only the spirit residing in a converted heart can give him the power to obey. And Herod doesn't have that. So he can be as sorry as he wants. Just like you or any, anyone, any human, we can be as sorry for our sin as we want and your sorrow will do nothing unless it is genuine repentance, which opens the door, of course, to the spirit. So his sorrow does not give him the power to obey. Only the indwelling spirit, only the converted heart gives him the power to obey. 